this is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and for a busy few days of UFO UAP news, I've got Dan joining me for a chat. Dan, how are we? I'm great, thank you. Nothing happens, and then it all happens, right? It oh, just always happens. Boy. Yeah, it seems in the last kind of 24, 40 hours, there have been at least three major stories that are all sort of linked together as well. I've noticed as I was kind of making notes and reading through them, yeah. they probably flow into each other quite nicely. So I thought it was a good chance for us to smash through and chat. And to be fair, Dan, as we're recording this, it's the 18th of April, it's evening time in the UK. Um, we've both had busy days. I've caught quite a lot of it, same as yourself. A lot of this is still kind of developing and a lot of conversation around the news is still developing too. Um, so there may be a few things, even as we speak about it, something else comes out tomorrow or someone confirms something. Um, but yeah, it's been been a pretty interesting couple of days. If you don't mind, we're going to start um, with the, the latest UAP caucus briefing. Um, there was a skiff held on the hill in Washington. If you're brand new to the podcast or brand new to UFOs, the last year or so, skiffs have been all the rage. Um, top secret, classified meetings where security clearances are all the rage and congressmen and women and other individuals go into a room, locked away and are told top secret stuff, uh, namely UFOs in this occasion, Dan, again, we have the, the usual cast of characters involved from a political point of view. We have representatives Eric Burleson, uh, Anna Paulina Luna, Tim Burchett, um, and is Andy Ogles? Yeah. That's right, yeah. And, and others were involved in this as How well. How did you forget the guy that has your name? <laughs> I wanted to call him Matt Ogles, but it's not Matt. It's so, just it's the, on the yeah. weekend. yeah. Andy Ogles, it sounds like a nickname more than a, a, an actual name, but um, <laughs> no offense to anyone who he is your representative. Um, but yeah, these folks are all on the side of UAP, UFO transparency. That's what they've been saying. They've been pushing for it now for some time. And I, I don't think we should forget that they also have other political aspirations, careers, things to go after on a daily basis so this is something that they are picking up and, and, and trying to push forward big shout out to matt laszlo from Askapol, who was there on the doorsteps chasing them down as soon as they came out the skiff just by the very nature of a skiff you're not going to hear what was said within the skiff because you're not allowed like i say it's, it's classified however uh, some of the comments from afterwards, Dan, uh, I'm going to start off with Representative Eric Burleson. Um, he was grabbed by Matt Laszlo from Askapol. And this is probably one of the more, if you're UFO friendly, which you almost definitely will be or should be listening to this, uh, slightly disappointing, but we'll start with the, the more disappointing comment. Um, he said to Matt Laszlo, this is Representative Eric Burleson, to be candid about information, I think that the goal is to demystify because what we don't want to see is that programs that are secure, that have nothing to do with extraterrestrials or anything like that, you don't want activity in those programs being exposed. I'm going to paraphrase slightly. Um, and so they want, because of that, if there's any commission, they want to get it out. And my worldview has been very sceptical that this is extraterrestrial and that remains sceptical. There's nothing that I learned today. In fact, I'm probably more validated today. Matt Laszlo asks Representative Burleson, you know, that what that your your skepticism is validated. And he says, yeah. Um, so from that point of view, Burleson said he feels they got some really good answers off the back of it. Uh, you can't attack him for, for feeling that way. He's coming to this relatively open-minded as much as he can be uh and he feels do you know what i'm skeptical this is anything et and he's come out of it saying i think that's justified um fair comment though wasn't it that's that's his opinion yeah and and this is what we want right is people coming to the table neutrally and hearing the information and then deciding where it is and you'll notice that we're in that area again between uh you, you know he's saying it's not et there, there are so many other things it could be that aren't just human-made craft. Um, so he might be feeling validated that it's not ET, but he he could be feeling validated that it's not in towards something else. And again, we've we've discussed this before. Even if it's foreign technology, it could be using the technology from these UAP programs that are running on foreign soil. So it's not clear cut, you know, us or them or them. Um, but I'm glad that he keeps coming to the table and, and doing so with an open mind. Yeah, and we've got to remember, it's not as if you've got 
the men in black. You've not got Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith turning up, delivering these skiffs and saying, here's some really cool videos of UFOs. But it's actually a drone. I don't think that's what happened. Burchett, uh, Tim Burchett was was pretty annoyed and he came out with Luna and Ogles afterwards. And um, when Matt Laszlo asked him, you know, his thoughts, he was so frustrated, he just said, ask her. He didn't even want to talk about it, you know, speak to Luna. Um, and he said, there's no reason that any of that needed to be told in a skiff. Luna used the phrase we all hate, but nothing burger, nothing, nothing burger, as she would say. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's nothing to this. It was it was just a total waste of our time. Um, and uh, Representative Andy Ogles, he said it was nothing other than to get us to not talk about it. So there's three senior politicians who are, they feel that they're being danced around here, that they're being given the like, you know the basics. They want to go in there and get a real high-class meal and they're being served to put a starter on the menu. They're getting bread with no butter um, deliberately, which they feel that... Again, and this is your congressmen and women, but I don't think at this point, if you've listened to the podcast for any length of time or had an interest in the UFO subject for any length of time, this shouldn't be a surprise just because the heads of state, the congressmen and women, senators are asking for information, there's nothing to show that any government's going to give them the information they want, really, is there? Especially when it comes to a topic like this, shrouded in secrecy for 80-plus for years now. Um, I don't think it was massively um, outside the realms of, they're just paying them lip service. Yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, we, we've got Bertrand here, he brings up the fact that the legislation wasn't good enough to stop something like this happening. Uh, he alludes that his legislation would have been better, it wouldn't have been, the same thing would have happened. Like you said, it's the government deciding, or sorry, not to say the government, a specific department in the government deciding we're only going to share limited information. They clearly didn't get kind of the data they were expecting or hoping and the transparency they were hoping for, and it sounds like they're real frustrated. And now we're in a position where Congress seems to not have faith in a program that was legislated into existence by Congress. So we're kind of at a stalemate here now, right? Where everyone's just fed up. They don't they don't have faith in the actual institution. The institution is saying, hey, we're being completely honest, but no one believes them. The whistleblowers are saying that they don't trust them. So we're we're at this kind of stalemate again where we're kind of wondering, you know, what's what's our even for anymore if they're not going to be transparent with the very people who brought it into existence? Hundred um, percent. A few more comments from them. Burchett says they they need a president who says to release it all. I've seen some folks are, are online saying he means Trump. I don't know if he does or doesn't. Um, he is Republican, but there's nothing to say Trump would release it all. Trump had four years in office and didn't release everything. Uh, didn't release well, anything. What really. I would add there is just that. So Marco Rubio, who's been very UAP friendly, is being tipped VP. to be Trump's running mate for vice president. Yeah. So that might be an interesting development if it happens because you know rubio wants this out and it could be his road to taking the office in the election after this one coming up to say you know i secured his base safety and found some form of life that no one else would tell you about it's a, it's a pretty good running message bill clinton had an interest and he had hillary in with him at the time yes. and they had you know podesta and stuff there it was back in the 90s but you know if you said now that they were coming in people would get excited but it never happened then so i think it's you've got to sit on the fence with you know what what would actually happen um, the the i think the only possible president that could have revealed something and this is literally just it didn't happen so we'll never know but it was thought that hillary was being tipped to be the uap disclosure president um and in that run up with ttsa sorry to the stars academy of arts and science tom delong Podesta, all that stuff. Supposedly, she was going to come out swinging and tell us everything. She's not said anything after the fact, though. So we just don't know. Yeah. Matt Laszlo says uh, to Burchett, do you think it's because they they don't know that the the people presenting this to you, at least like you say, Dan, quote unquote, the government, but the folks who are presenting this to you, plausible deniability. And Burchett says, yeah, he agrees. He thinks that's part of the compartmentalization. Uh, Public hearings hopefully still on for this year. Burchett says he hopes it's folks from the scientific community. He feels they're our best hope to push this forward. So whether that is whistleblowers coming forward involved in the science behind this, or it's your folks like Gary Nolan and Co, the Sol Foundation, whether it's SCU, the Galileo Project, all these different avenues of attack, 
there are a, there's a growing and burgeoning scientific community and involvement in the UFO UAP subject, um, which I think are are pretty um pretty good candidates for pushing this forward. I, I do think still though that we could use those hearings having some, and this is something the Danny Sheen interview. If anyone's listened to it yet, it's available on the early access stuff and it's coming out soon. Um, we go into about the whistleblowers and what the backgrounds really need to be and what sort of statements could we realistically hear publicly and, and in the background from these folks. Um, Dan, I've got a question for you. So politically, it seems that the, the doors for this are becoming increasingly harder to open. If you look back over the last what year or two from, from Gillibrand, you know, starting a little bit of a something to the Brian Moultrie kind of deposition and floundering and then the UAP hearing with Grush, Fravor and Graves, it seemed like there was a lot of opportunity. It seems like a lot of those opportunities are kind of slowly being snuffed out or at least the doors are being slammed in people's faces. Um, where do you kind of sit where things are just now? I'm I'm kind of getting uneasy with it, to be honest. In, in previous years, we've had this passage of legislation going through very quietly, and there wasn't much noise about it. Stuff got through. You know, it was edited over the year and changed very much like the, the UAP Disclosure Act last year that didn't pass. But that was a really good example of suddenly we've got a lot of attention, and suddenly the thing that we all want goes away. Whether it was right or wrong to kind of make it go away, I'm not commenting on. But more attention brought more, you know, critique of, of what it was and where the money should be spent on it and so on and so forth. And I, I think politicians, you know, we, we've got a bunch of wars happening and their attention is elsewhere. But there's always other stuff going on and they still had time for UAP a few years back. So part of me thinks that their interest is waning or at least their willingness to put themselves in the public spotlight regarding this issue is kind of waning. We're still hearing that Chuck Schumer is being briefed and is helping with the kind of eminent domain stuff for, for a you know UAP disclosure at Redux this year in NDAA. But it remains to be seen how much how, how hard that's going to be pushed. You know, Chuck didn't speak out until it failed last year. Whereas maybe if he spoke out before and actually kind of tried to rally the troops, so to speak maybe more people would have come to its support, but he didn't. So I'm hoping they take a different tack this year and they get a few more people from both sides of the aisle on board because this is a bipartisan issue. And right now I feel like it's kind of becoming a Republican and House issue. And we just kind of could do with broadening it out and getting a bit more attention. I know less than there, or sorry, Neri, uh, with the UAP caucus a different uap caucus now this is a, a public organization and a website yeah. and things like that he's been putting together with a bunch of other people mo and stuff such brief impacts for senators and and going into their office and talking to them and, and trying to get them involved so i'm hoping that this kind of boots on the ground really professional clean you know nice approach is is going to kind of catch catch a few people with with honey you know yeah, I think maybe one of the big differences, to be fair, is the the politicians had time for it a year or two years ago. We're now in the election year and things go on the back burner. What is an important subject for us isn't necessarily for them. And you can imagine yeah. if they did even have a, a huge interest in it, just say a, a brochette, he's sitting at his desk and he's trying to get stuff done with the UAP issue and he's been forced from other corners. You have to deal with this. You have to deal with this. You have to deal with this. And that's going to be happening at every level up the food up yeah. the food chain in, in those areas. So I, I get why the, the election's the big thing. Um, I have think you, have you that, had a change of heart on the whether it's going to be spoken about in the elections? I, I uh, No, it won't. I remember last time I asked you that, I said, I kind of think it might be, and I'm kind of on your side now. Like, I've, I've just shifted. I don't think it will come up. I think I said, and the beauty of social media and the internet in this format is people can go and find it. I think I said, if it is raised, it'll be a joke question again. Um, I, I don't think it'll be raised in any real serious way, if, if maybe, at all. Maybe Will Smith will do Men in Black with some aliens on stage again. Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> slap someone in the face again live on TV. Um, yeah. So I, th I think this is essentially things are a lot of politicians are being stonewalled here and uh, doors are getting slammed in faces. This is where I think law, due process, all that kind of stuff just goes out the window. It's one thing 
and I know we've got friends and colleagues I've spoke to and we're, we're not American, so I don't like to speak for, for anyone's processes. But I think this goes worldwide. Just because you have a process that should be followed doesn't mean it's going to be, especially for something this highly secretive. Um it just isn't. It just doesn't happen. I don't believe that that, that to be the case for any country. So, um, let me just read a, a quick uh, listener thought on this one uh, from Nosis. Uh, he says, "So, um, the arrow scaff. It sounds like Congress is disappointed, which is good news. I was worried it would be middling, giving Congress just enough to quell concerns and hope they ease off the topic. But it seems like this has added fuel to the fire." Arrow's motives are still not clear, and until we get another report or two released, it's hard to see their plan to survive long term. Um, interesting point. Yeah, definitely. That that survival long term for Arrow, that's a big question mark for me right now, it, especially after reading, well, we're going to cover it, so I'll, I'll get into it when we cover the, the thing. Let, let's go on to it, because like I say, I think the news does trickle into each other it, and they're really all does. pretty relevant. We could have went even into the, the Grush, Mel and Kirkpatrick stuff, but the, the Kona Blue files, Dan, my notes for this are all over the place. Um, they are... They dropped a couple of days ago now, didn't they, online two or three days ago? Yes, 16th they dropped, um, and they were meant to be disclassified um, in 2036, around the same date. So we got them earlier than we were meant to. Uh, yeah. But these these are essentially where Arrow speaks about Kona Blue in their report and what they found with it. This is their evidence for what they said. Cool. So Kona Blue, pretty cool looking set of documents, especially it had a pretty cool cover on it, Dan. It wasn't just the usual black and white nonsense. Um, dropped you, by Arrow, party. which... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, dropped by Arrow, which I think is a talking point in itself. Um, it was a, a proposed program within the Department of Homeland Security aimed at reverse engineering, essentially extraterrestrial technology, but I think it's important to say for anyone who's listening to this and going, what? Well, I've not heard of this. It was never fully implemented or put into practice. It was a suggestion. And from what I'm reading, and I'll probably get this badly wrong, it's a little bit like you going to your boss and work and saying, I've got this project. I've got a great idea. And they say, yeah, put together a PowerPoint for it. You do it. And nothing comes of it. That's that's kind of what it was. Is that right? Yeah, I, I would say that's the that's the kind of concise way to sum it up. There are a few kind of subtleties throughout it where it looks like the boss has kind of pre-approved the program. And then it's only when the boss's boss has got involved, they've said no and shot it down. Yeah. Uh, there are a few other little things with it. But yeah, that, that's basically it. This whole thing's a proposal. So when you read the document and you see that it says, we, you know, we believe there is technology within the United States government that is exotic or from an AAV, which is um, an Anomalous advanced aerial, aerial vehicle. Yeah, advanced. advanced anomalous. You, you know, this this was the phrasing used for UFOs around this time. So yeah. this is what they're talking about. But AAV, a drone would have been called an AAV around this time frame as well. So, you know, they, they kind of, they're playing inside baseball a little bit here. And we can look at this document two ways. Either we, you know, we, we can see that Lakatsky and all the guys that worked on ORSAP, this is their program trying to grow up. And the way that they've spoken about this program is that they were kind of trying to get inside the real programs. So you can look at this document as a proposal for a backward psyop into the United States government, kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing to hide amongst them, get the good stuff and get it out to us. The other way we can look at it is that, you know, when you read through this and it says they want to collect data, they want to analyze, you, you know, oral histories, they want to collect evidence, they want to get education kind of going um, and interview people that have had experiences and, you know, be a central repository. It sounds a lot like Arrow. And they also mm. say that they will play, you know, they'll play properly and they'll classify this and keep it secret. So it kind of rubbed me up a little bit the wrong way reading it because this is Bigelow once again after having a whole bunch of taxpayer money, hiding the reports that he generated out of this taxpayer money, and now he's doing it again and proposing he wants even more, 70 to 90 million to, to do this project, but he wants to keep it secret. So I'm just, I'm, you know, I read it and I was just a bit disappointed. There are some really intriguing aspects to what they want to do, but ultimately it's, we want to keep this secret again, you know? 
there's I know you mentioned Bigelow as one of the names and the, the funding on there is marked at various different places, which is interesting. That also brings up the, the ATIP slash OSAP funding that's yes. mentioned on there, the $10 million, which was then a further $12 million for um, Senator Harry Reid and Senator Inouye uh, are both named on there. Um, like I say, ATIP's named on there. The We don't know exactly who put it together, though, do we? Because I think Danny Sheehan mentioned on an interview just the other day that uh, he calls them the assumptions on it. This isn't a list of here's loads of evidence for stuff we have found. It basically assumes, you know, extraterrestrial vehicles, yes. extraterrestrial exotic technologies. It's, it's put forward with, we're going on the basis this stuff exists. It doesn't list the evidence of that. So that's that's important to point out. Danny Sheehan said he knows who put forward the assumptions and the proposal, but he can't say who. But to him, it makes sense why the information's there. So if he knows the individual behind it, I mean, but for you, Dan, does that sound like it's a Lakatsky, like it's an Elizondo or or someone else? I mean, Lakatsky ran the OSAP program, so it would make sense for him to be involved in this document. Danny's right. We have no name on it, so it's impossible for me to say who wrote it. But there are a few clues that it came from a certain group. And like you said, the assumption is there's even a really nice quote on page 47 where it says, an SAP is being proposed as we have been informed that there is a body of previous work held by other entities that require an SAP level classification to access it, i.e. we've been told something and we need this classification to be able to see it. Give us the classification so we can see it. That That's what this is, really. Yeah, a couple of things within it, um, and I think these are to be fair, and there's a few various various quotes kicking about uh, online as well. Um, the program never went into happening. It was terminated, essentially, before it got going as for a few reasons, including nothing was ever recovered, allegedly. Um, it was only assumed these materials or anything existed, like I mentioned before. Um, it was aimed, and I think you were right, Dan, to say, and I like that you've done what I usually do, that it could be looked at a few different ways. We don't know. This is, it could be pure disinformation, big psyop, but, you know, is what it is. Um, they were looking for this to be an effort towards some kind of transparency. Um, the documents get associated with Kona Blue have all been declassified and released to the public through Arrow. Um, that, I think, like I mentioned before, seems a little bit suspect in itself because Arrow doesn't seem like it was being the most transparent, yet here you go, here's a lovely set of documents for you that we have found as part of our investigations. Um, these were declassified, Dan, two days after David Grush testified to Congress in July. Why do you not think that this was included within Arrow's report that they just released? So this would be in kind of supplemental material. When when we had the NDAA go through last year and it basically dictated that, um, or sorry, kindly suggested, dictated is the wrong word to use in a democracy, I guess, <laughs> um, that everything be held by the National Archives. This is the kind of document that goes to the National Archives. When the Arrow report came out, a lot of us were like, well, where's your workings? We want to see the data that led to you to these assumptions. Um, this, this is that, but really it should have come out at the same time and been accessible so that we could all check the workings and see. And, you know, it's essentially what peer review is, right? A lot of us are mm. looking at some of the claims, seeing that they've got some claims wrong, like, you know, how they describe Roswell and various other, you know, really important things that show, like, a lot of assumptions on on part of Arrow. And they all kind of lead to to the idea that, you know, some, someone's not being entirely truthful here with what's kind of being talked about. But this one was essentially Sean Kirkpatrick, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, the head of Arrow at the time, said that he spoke to a number of individuals who came in and told him that Kona Blue was the UFO legacy yeah. secure access program that studied this stuff. And knowing that it was actually this and it never went ahead, he was able to say, well, that's that's clearly nonsense. And, you know, these guys have just gotten a story and a repeat in it and so on and so forth. Personally, as, as you know, as iffy as Arrow has been for me, I think that's a good thing to do. You know, if someone could come in and they're essentially telling you a code word that proves that what they're saying isn't, you know, the the golden goose or the golden egg, then yeah, you can you can filter that out. This is this is what we want, right? Take the normal stuff out, take the hearsay out, and let's get down to brass tacks. It's just whether they're being honest about, you know, the the rest of it is is the question when so much is wrong in their report. Do you think this is just a bit of What's the word? Not publicity, but um, 
face saving from Arrow or is it just a way of basically saying look here is here is some of the working you know I know we've came to the conclusion there's nothing to this but here's another one of these things we found we've declassified it it was just all hearsay and assumptions I think for folks like us let's be fair we're really interested in hearsay and assumptions because it makes up part of the mythology and the, the subject uh-huh. it, it just is part of it so we like to dig into stuff like this and you can see the the and I, I mean this in the nicest way the usual suspects on, you know, Twitter, X and stuff are picking through it and finding really interesting quotes. They're finding interesting excerpts. They're finding, you know, like those kind of, oh, ATIP was mentioned, Lou Elizondo was mentioned, Bigelow was mentioned, that it justifies maybe some things that others have argued did or didn't happen. Um, but it's it's one of the, it's just another vague vagueness released into the UFO subject. As much as some of it sounds pretty interesting. Um yeah, the, like, for uh, example, they say temporal translation, which is like time skipping and dematerialization and rematerialization, that kind of stuff. There's no I evidence here. Just, oh, really? Just want to get, yeah, I was going to say, I was like, because time travel almost mentioned, the consciousness stuff's mentioned, rem- yep. remote viewing is called remote sensing, all that kind of stuff's in there. The UFO topic is in this presentation. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> I, I was reading my notes and I just, the last sentence I missed. <laughs> I was like, did you disconnect there for a second? <laughs> yes. No, it's just literally just a brain wipe. <laughs> that, Dan's now an AI and it just flickered there for a second when it just went, yes, absolutely. You can tell I have six fingers on each hand now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, so it's, it's it's an interesting release, interesting document. Um, I think there's, I think you have to read behind this. For the yes. skeptics, I think this just adds more fuel to the fire of this is all just assumptions, not based on any evidence and secondhand stories passed down. And let's be that's not totally unfair given what is presented here. But for folks like us, people listening, people watching, interested in the UFO topic, you're probably looking at this going, this was something that had real basis to it. And I suppose, though, without knowing the names of who put this together and maybe some of the context behind it and those individuals coming out now, what, some 10, 12 years later, whatever it might be, Mm -hmm. and saying, actually, here's some of the reasoning. I think this is the kind of stuff I'd like to see Ross Coulthard following up with, George Knapp following up with, James Fox, uh, Jeremy Corbell. These are folks who will probably know if Danny Sheehan knows, they will know who's involved in it. Yeah. And they speak to them. And I imagine, and this is what I say, Dan, that over the next few days, you'll probably find more comes out around this. Some more detail comes out around it. I'd like to see some of those those folks making some interesting statements off the back of it to really help some of us dig into it a little bit more. Um, I yeah, had a couple you, of quotes from it as well. Make a point. Yeah, go on. I, I was just going to add, like, to, to understand this document, at the very least, you have to read Lou Elizondo's DOD IG complaints. You have to read Skinwalkers of the Pentagon. You have to read, uh, I forget the more current name. Is the book behind you? Uh, Knapp and Kelleher's newer book. Um, oh, Inside the U.S. Government's Covert UFO Program, Initial Revelations. Nice, nice, re- memorable tile there. That's why I can remember it. Yeah, rolls um, off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you, you kind of have to read all of this material and put the puzzle pieces together and you'll see the same names pop up through them. You'll see them kind of fill out details of conversations that are alluded to in this document. And that will give you kind of a complete picture of what's happening. One of these documents on their own is not going to kind of give you everything. And it it kind of becomes a bit choose your own adventure when you don't do that and you just kind of take these statements at face value from either side of the debate, you know? 100%, yeah, uh, that's it. Um, A couple of questions, Dan, from folks, thoughts, opinions. I've not read through all these, so if any swears come out here, it's because I've not read them (laughs) properly in advance. I just loaded up the pages. I've just been really lazy with this one. Um, So a couple from YouTube first off. Here's Johnny says, Andy, brackets and dan do you think that congress will ever get the truth from the dod i'm going to say a big no no matter what verbal evidence is brought into light by extremely credible people it's going to take actual physical evidence to shake the average joe from the skepticism tree we pin our hopes on these meetings and hearings and we will all know what the outcome will be but yet we still have hope why this is probably related to the first one as well um dan i think i don't think they're going to get the dod coming out and saying okay hands up here's the good stuff unless their hands are forced um, by whistleblowers and whatnot yeah I, I would agree and at this point if the dod you know if you think about it if the dod 
know that there's something in their past where they touched this stuff and they did do what everyone is, is accusing them of, they're not going to tell us that. They're going to sweep it under the rug. They're going to protect their own. They're going to move them departments like they did with Gary Reed and just give them lesser jobs and whatever. And they're going to be happy that, you know, the European Space Agency announces it and they can go, oh, yeah, no, we didn't. No, we've never seen that before. What a, what a crazy bit of news, you know? They're just going to pretend that it's the first time. I think they'd be very happy if that was to happen. They'll be like, oh, we don't have alien stuff. We've got some future human tech, though. But you never asked about that. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, and and really, you, you know, what what do we get out of them kind of telling us? Like, for you and I, we'd love to see them go back to, you know, is Phoenix Light real? Is Roswell real? Is all of this other stuff real? But when history looks back, it's just going to see at this in this year, we found out we're not alone. And that's it. It's just going to be a line in a history book, and it'll change us a lot. But... No one but, you know, you or I or, you know, Post Disclosure, Vinny, Graham, um, Knapp, Marla, like, we're, we're all digging into the, the minutia of it, but most people are not going to care. No, they, they won't care about, you know, oh, it's covered up at Roswell, so let's let's bring these people to justice and you know, jail their grandkids. Um, Jacob P. <laughs> says, while I'm glad the documents are released, it seems like Arrow have ulterior motives behind it. They'll probably use it to disparage folks like Grush and Elizondo. That may be something that we'll come back to, Dan, given the next news topic. Um, Stephanie says, the teleportation of matter through space and time is a recurring feature of the phenomenon that definitely deserves further investigation. It would be simply great if such technology could be used for humanitarian purposes to retrospectively and proactively prevent disasters and save people from death. However, any misuse of this technology as a weapon must be dececisively countered. We talked about that, Dan, ages ago, didn't we? On like a what if type episode um, and how this idea that any of this technology coming out would change humanity overnight and we were like i don't think it will um the really really good book after disclosure ad from richard dolan co-authored by bryce abel and um, one for the discord chat there um did bryce they, write they, that with him he did he did i think oh. it's uh, eight, minute, <laughs> eight minutes into the need to know he mentions that um but yeah, really, really good book. And I'd love to see them follow up with some extra chapters. Yeah, definitely. Really. Um, but they mention that kind of stuff as well. And I've had, I've had guests on recently, Dan, and others have spoken about when this stuff comes out, it's not going to be the Jetsons flying cars, Star Trek tricorders, and medicine heal, healing everyone overnight. It's going to be insurance companies giving you abduction insurance and lawsuits going back to, to military personnel injured by UAP and exposed to radiation. Uh, that's that's going to be the real life side of it. You know, Elon Musk and Tesla buying up some of the rights to this stuff and selling it for a profit. Yeah, your car's battery will never need replaced and it'll be electric. You're going to pay for it. So that's probably the realistic side of the, what would happen more so than anything else. So yeah, um, but again, that kind of stuff is talked about within it. Um, Der Deravas says, Kona Blue is just more words on paper. It will convince no one of something extraordinary who doesn't already believe in the extraordinary. But the way it is written and the words that are used can solidify suspicions the same way... Um, uh, the same way the wording of the Schumer Amendment did. And finally, uh, Matthias, uh, Matthias Cruz says, Kona Blue is maybe a distraction to congressmen to ask the wrong questions. Thoughts on those, Dan? Really interesting. You know, I, I love the idea that, uh, well, love is the wrong word, but being aware, I think, that the planet isn't the same for all of us is really important, you know? If they were to bring this technology out, you and I would hear it. We're plugged in. There are plenty of people that wouldn't even know about the announcement, and it would take so much time for it to kind of trickle down. Um, you know, take AI, for example, generative AI. We talk about it often. You know, if you're online, you kind of come across it, but many people don't know it exists. You know, my mom certainly doesn't. It blows her mind. I only showed her last week. It's been around for like a year and a half. Um, or even how to begin using it, right? I spoke to yeah. somebody who watched Three Body Problem. And they were amazed by the particle accelerator. And that Netflix show for them was the moment that they learned the particle accelerators were real things real thing. yeah. and not just random things in sci-fi and blew my mind. But, you know, we, we have to be aware of that. Like not everyone's on the same page, even when we think of things like, you know, smartphones. It's Dan, not do you, everyone has do you, one. Do you think someone should be embarrassed that they never knew the Large Hadron Collider was a real thing? No, not at all. 
Okay, so like, Susan gets away with one then. That's fine. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm a massive heard. nerd, so I'm like, oh, I know, and I, I learned, and I watched the opening, and you know, so on and so forth. But yeah. Susan would be like, yeah, I was busy. I had a better day than you. I went out and touched grass, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, but a, a few more comments. These are from the Patreon folks. Uh, David Fairclaw said it was good uh, that it vindicated Luis Elizondo. Dates and amounts of money matched with the note from Harry Reid. Uh, Christian Morales says, all I'll say is I felt like it was a gamble on the part of Sean Kirkpatrick by declassifying information that one learns about in the end stages of, let's call it, the UFO rabbit hole. If there's five gears in a car, then that's the fifth gear. It's a gamble because it can create interest but also turn people off as woo-woo stuff. Stuff. Your typical intelligent, rational minded person might think this sounds ridiculous and could stigmatize and isolate the UFO community. Probably echoes what you've just said there, Dan, that you know some folks just won't be interested, others will. And I think you can see already just from the last couple of days of online interaction from folks, there's been a lot of arguing back and forward and people using elements of it to to drive their narrative. Yeah. Um in the same way someone uses a religious text, i.e. a Bible, to, to quote it and interpret in their own way. That's sure. kind of what happens with this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, Peter absolutely. Earnshaw, Peter Earnshaw says, uh, Unfortunate, I sense the hand of Richard Doty or his successor in role. Uh, Sean Hancock said, It's interesting, either a calculated release meant to stigmatize the UFO topic or a step towards disclosure. I can see it being used to prepare uh, perpetuate Kirkpatrick's narrative that it's just a few UFO nuts misleading Congress. I don't think that's unfair, just from what we said before. Not that that's the case, but I think sure. that could be a, a reason. Um, on the other hand, maybe, just maybe, it's a step towards disclosure. And final comment, Dan, um, thanks to everyone who did submit stuff. I'm puzzled by the role, and this is from Max, I'm puzzled by the role of somewhat woo- um, Put off Ingo Swan, uh, Bigelow Nexus. It seems clear Kirkpatrick wants to paint this cohort as delusional. Hard to parse the layers of mis and disinformation, the motives of various players, and how much access any of them have to various SAPs. I think it's quite possible that there are secret programs in possession of non human tech and simultaneously those programs are so siloed and insular that people in and adjacent to them have created a lot of lore that is not especially evidence based. Thank you, Max. Thank you, everyone. My final comment on this, Dan, is I feel these Kona Blue documents are really interesting. Um, I've no reason to believe they aren't genuine or, or have the best intentions. But for me, these are the equivalent of the the Go Fast video or the Gimbal video. You know where we have said, we've always kind of said they're, they're interesting to us, but boring enough to be released. And there's enough behind it that they... They can't be backed up without more being released that we're not going to get anytime soon. Um, where do you sit on them? I'm, I'm the same. You know, there was one comment there that said they've vindicated Lou. And, you know, personally, I believe Lou. I believe what Lou did and so on and so forth. I don't think these documents vindicate anybody because it's a proposal. If it's being written by the OSAP guys, it's the same guys kind of eating their own tail. It's the UFO or a Boris. He, you know, the rumor goes out, it comes back around, it's stated, and that's taken as corroboration. And we see this all the time in like news articles about UFOs and things like that. We've got to be careful kind of saying that this, um, you know, vindicates people. The one thing that I did like about it was all these little tidbits that clued us into things that we hadn't heard before that Bigelow and team were doing. One of the things that I, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what people find is there are two other study locations mentioned that aren't Skinwalker Ranch, one in the San Juan Valley in Colorado and Marley's Woods in Missouri. What's there? Let us know. I'm going to do some Googling and try and find out. Awesome, yeah. Um, and I think, again, what trickles into that, we've mentioned... David Grush, we've mentioned Sean Kirkpatrick and uh, news that came out just today as we record this, uh, there were some FOIA documents, so Freedom of Information Act uh, requested documents revealing Arrow's authorised and repeated attempts to engage with David Grush. Now that's the headline John Greenwald at the Black Vaults put out there. Um, there's some interesting stuff around this. Dan, there has been a hell of a lot of dissection and debate already around the contents of what was released. Um, so this is a FOIA request John Greenwald put in to uh, the 
you know, US government back on, on November 2nd, he says. Now, that's a hell of a quick turnaround for some of the stuff he doesn't get for 15 years. So yeah. uh, John's clearly got a friend there sending him this stuff quickly, or they're at least being selective on what they send him quickly. Um, but he's done a really good job of putting this all on his website. I'll put the link in the description. Um, some of, the, some of the main things for me here, Dan, I'm just going to go back to my notes I was on the website. There, there were some big talking points I've seen online because there are interactions and email exchanges and text message exchanges between Chris Mellon, Sean Kirkpatrick, and emails from David Grush to Addo back and forward. And one of the big things I saw appear from this was this shows that David Grush and I'm not saying this, this is was the, the context online. David Grush lied, saying he'd never spoken to Arrow, and this shows that he did speak to Arrow. From what I can gather in the last couple of hours, just looking at it, um, the, the conversations between Grush and Arrow happened after David Grush had said in those hearings that he hadn't been in contact with them. I would also imagine at that time, if any contact was being mooted or talked about david grush's lawyer charles mccullough the third who it was at the time would have been recommending he doesn't speak to arrow all we have heard about arrow now for the last couple of years is that people have been you know circumventing arrow they've been going around the process because they have not trusted nor wanted to speak to arrow about any of their claims about their their processes about what they want to talk about they'd rather go direct to folks in congress or folks higher up um, we have heard from folks who did speak to Arrow. Uh, who was it released? Was it was it Robert Salas released part of his audio recording to Arrow? Am I That's right. Yeah, that? yeah, Robert Salas. But it was like it, it was really. He felt it was really poorly done. It wasn't very well orchestrated. Just a list of questions being asked over the phone. Um, so, in part, I can see why David Grush wouldn't have wanted to go to Arrow anyway. And it seems like that was also, I believe, cleared up. Chris uh, Sharp at Liberation Times had an article out in January where David Grush had confirmed to him that he had, after the fact, then spoken to Arrow to try and arrange something, but he didn't trust, essentially, how they were going to handle classified information and his sources, his methods. Um, so a complete lack of trust in the Arrow process, which, let's be fair, we have heard from numerous different people over the course of the last year. So I don't think any of that should be surprising. So for me, I can't see David Grush has lied. Uh, I can see David Grush's comments were backed up in January. And I don't know if some folks just jumped on the headlines a little bit with this one that David Grush had, had no contact with Arrow when he clearly had. Is that right? It, yeah. And it, it's funny because in, in the document itself, even Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, head of Arrow at the time, contradicts himself. He says, we didn't, uh, wait there, let me, let me read the quote just so I'm using Sean's words and not kind of paraphrasing. Sean says, I've have had a continued conversation with him, meaning Grush for years. And then literally two lines later says, I haven't spoken to him for years. And it's like, was well, this, is it? And he's, is he texting Chris Mellon at this point? He's texting back and forth with Chris Mellon. Yeah. And it's really confusing to read those two statements really quickly after each other. And there's a few other kind of contradictions in there as well, where Kirkpatrick doesn't want to give his contact info to Grush or his lawyer so they can get in touch. So you can see that it, it's not quite as clear cut. You know, you can't say Grush refused to go to them because they did. Yep. He was asking for contact info, you know, Mellon was asking for contact info and Sean refused it, which is insanity. You, you know, he's not trying to kind of pave the way for Grush to speak to them. Um, he also says that he already knows everything that Grush was briefed on and had access to, and he has greater access. So it seems that there's some assumptions being made about Grush's story before Grush has even spoken to them. There's a little illusion as well with some of the anonymous text messages that Arrow's been trying to set up some kind of back channels between the committees and Arrow to say, hey, if someone comes to you, you let us know and we'll come and listen and sit in with them talking to you instead of us. Which again isn't kind of fair. That's that's not what it is. You know, if the people don't want to talk to Arrow, they don't want to talk to Arrow. Grush was very distinct in what his request was. And I'm just gonna read this. It's a little wall of texty, but I'm just gonna read it because this is Grush saying way back when when Arrow said that we, you know, we're we're gonna organize a meeting with you and then that you didn't show up, Arrow didn't address his asks. They didn't give him what he wanted to show up and he yep. didn't show up. That's kind of logical, right? So 
Gresham. This was on the 14th of November, 2023, which some, you know, eagle-eyed people might realize that's the anniversary of the Tic Tacs item with the Nimitz. Uh, nice, nice touch. Don't, don't know if that was intentional. Maybe Grush or brought cake or something. Uh, but he says, with due respect, I need answers to my questions before I'll be comfortable meeting. Please provide responses so that we can hopefully move forward and schedule a meeting. The law may grant your office a need to know, but it does not establish policies and procedures with various data owners. I have managed multi-compartmented activities throughout my entire career and have multiple DCSA security professional certifications. I did not ask these questions for mere curiosity. He's losing his rag there a bit with him, getting a bit annoyed with Sean Kirkpatrick because Sean Kirkpatrick clearly isn't giving him what he needs. And this kind of alludes to a little bit of like mucking around in terms of messages. It's clear that, you know, for whatever reason, they just haven't been able to get on the same page here. For Sean to say that Grush is refusing to come in is just not true. For Grush to say that he's not being got in touch with is just not true. There's a conversation here and just the requirements for the conversation yeah. to happen have not been met. That's all. No, I'm glad you've said that because I think I, I try on this all times as much as possible to to let people make up their own mind and people always should. Um, and I think it's just not just the UFO topic, but it happens a lot within the UFO topic that people will jump on the slightest little indiscretion to go, ha, they're lying, they've made it up. When, like you say, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Arrow did try to reach out, so it wasn't like they hadn't been in contact. However, it wasn't that David Grush was ignoring them completely. There were conversations going on, no doubt other folks are involved who aren't cited in this material. Um, and the, the truth is probably somewhere in the murky middle. I'm always going to lean the same as you, Dan, more towards David Grush, because ultimately he sat in front of Congress and said what he said. We've seen him take an oath, right? <laughs> yep. And and like you say, no doubt if if you sat Kirkpatrick and Grush face to face uh, under oath for whatever reason, just to have that little almost childish conversation around, you know, did you fall out? Did you fall? Are you telling the truth? It would they'd end up saying, no. Do you know what? I I didn't mean that. What I meant was that I hadn't heard from an official back channel. Blah 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 blah. What we're seeing here is. The same way if me and you argued over Twitter, Dan, over a three-day period, you know, on various different threads, you're going to lose context, you're going to lose nuances, what was going on at the time, um, your your mood changes in the day. These guys were texting each other and also emailing at separate times. Yep. So it's, it's just all a bit of a mess anyway, but that's just life. And I think people, if they want to jump on this and try and find something that probably isn't there, they'll find it. Um, I think it's just an interesting exchange. Ultimately, the only thing that comes out of it for me is that there were conversations going on, I think, that anyone would have expected, and that David Grush wasn't avoiding Arrow. Uh, Arrow maybe weren't going out of their way to get Grush, but, you know, there, there was contact made at some point. So I yeah, don't think I there was a whole lot more to it, to be honest. The two two things that I would mention from it, just uh, it was specified that Grush has bad blood with Sean going back to 2015. This is Sean Kirkpatrick, head of Arrow again. So something happened in 2015. We're not privy to. We don't know. Could have trampled on his favorite flower or something. You know, like clearly there's some animosity there. The tone in the conversations was a little less professional than I was, uh, than I was hoping. But Sean Kirkpatrick also said this at one point. If Grush's lawyer successfully makes the case that we aren't lawfully empowered, there will be a lot less appetite to keep Arrow, which alludes to what we've already touched on here. And Sean's essentially saying from within Arrow here, what's even our job if people aren't going to talk to us? And yeah. it, it feels it feels a little bit like tomfoolery. I, I don't think Sean should be thinking like that. I think he should just be focused forward, look at the cases that he is given, instead of saying, eh, maybe you should shut this down because David Grush doesn't want to talk to us. I don't think it's unfair to say from this point, you know, hindsight being 2020, Sean Kirkpatrick didn't enjoy his role. He didn't want to do that role. Um, I'd agree. I, I don't think it's as conspiratorial as many folks make out. Um, did he have a bias? Probably. Uh, in the negative towards the UFO subject, but I just don't think he wanted to be there. And I think he was asked maybe to do something that was going to be short term. Ultimately, it was relatively short term and he'll get moved on to something much nicer where he has done, you know, contractor work, 
um, afterwards and be looked after. So, but who yeah. knows? And that's the kind of stuff that we won't probably find out for many years, and unless it comes in one of these FOIA document requests. But well done to to John Greenwald getting that stuff up and out. Yeah, it's a good get. Did. Thank you. He's he's great at the old FOIA. Dan, in about a minute, you had a couple of things to mention. Can you fly through? <laughs> yes, I'll go as fast as I can. So. You should do like a news kind of beep thing, right? <laughs> beep, like some music. <laughs> beep. Uh, so Steven Spielberg, apparently he's working on a new UFO movie confirmed by Variety. Um, apparently, uh, and this is the quote, Spielberg will m- will likely make his next project, a UFO film based on his own original idea. David co yeah. is writing the screenplay, sources say. He's written Jurassic Park, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom and the Crystal Skull. Two ends of the movie spectrum there, so we'll, we'll see what comes out of it. But I'm excited. Like what? What movie would you want to see from Spielberg? Yeah, but big budget, be well produced, it'll look good, um, and he's got a good record with ET stuff. Um, if we don't include Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, <laughs> uh, like I, I say, ET stuff. ET was fantastic, so you know. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it was only the interdimensionals in Indiana Jones that kind of fell down. So stay away from interdimensionals, and let's see what we can get. Stay away from shit movies, ideally. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Execs won't learn that lesson though. You know, they they keep going, oh, people like Barbie, so we'll make more movies about toys. No, people like good movies. Um, there was a great episode of Joe Rogan this week with archaeologist Flint Dibble from Cardiff University, just down the road here. Big props to Cardiff. And Graham Hancock, um, who people will know as someone that vouches for there being a pre-Ice Age civilization. Uh, that was kind of world widespread and seafaring and so on and so forth. They actually had debate over the evidence. It was four and a half hours long. And I won't go too much into what it is because I honestly think people should watch it and make up their own mind. They got a bit handbags for like a half hour. But ultimately, they had a respectful, reasonable conversation about the evidence as to why Graham's idea is so far off base. And I learned a hell of a lot just watching it about how they trace agriculture through seeds and how plants mutate over thousands of years and you know how they analyze shipwrecks and core samples and the pollen to kind of get an idea of the environment and it was really fascinating so i'd recommend go watch that i wouldn't say that you know there was a winner i came out of it more intrigued than ever to kind of dive into the data and even joe rogan was convinced on some points as well so big props to those two for just going on and having a good conversation instead of just sniping each other over twitter there was a Excellent TTSA Talks episode, um, episode 13, where Tom Zalong and Jim Semivan picked up where they left off before. They spoke about things like egregores and uh, the, the phenomenon feeding on us, the airship mystery, things like that. And Tom presented his new model of the phenomena, which was very similar to his old model, to be honest. It's kind of a bit new cokey, but ultimately, you know, that kind of cargo cult idea that something interdimensional is coming here and, and it kind of wants to use us for something. Sammy Van mentioned Charles Fort in the Book of the Damned. I've mentioned him before because he's kind of the first guy who said, you know what, science is going to look at this stuff. I'm going to. It happens in the world. Therefore, it's scientific to look at it. Therefore, you know, I'll look at it. So that's Charles Fort is literally where if anyone's ever heard the name, uh, you know, the 40 in times or 40 in subjects, that's where mm-hmm. it comes from, from a scientist that was willing to look in good faith at the weirder stuff in the world, which I, you know, thought was great. <laughs> Big breath. Last one. So in, in about a month, we have a new book coming out from AJ Hartley and Tom DeLong called Trinity that is supposed to be another piece of the UFO puzzle. We're really looking forward to that. But also we got an inkling that the third volume of God's Man and War is finally coming out this year. Apparently it's going to come out 17th of September, but there's a bit of leeway on that, according to Peter Lavender. Um, props to Stephen A.P. Wales on Twitter for, for breaking this as well. Um, I'm just going to read the blurb for the book just so that people can kind of get an idea of what it's going to be about. With God's, we ask the first question. Does our religion and our science give evidence that human civilization is a cargo cult triggered by contact sometime in prehistory? With man, the second book, we ask the second question. If we apply what we know of science, of physics, biology, and anthropology to the phenomena, how will that change our science as well as our understanding of the alien? With war, we ask the final question. Are the first two questions being addressed or perhaps have already been answered by our political, military, scientific, and intelligence leaders? The United States, Russia, China, and other countries around the world have experienced contact with the phenomena, as we will discover in war. Americans demand that their leaders reveal what they know. They demand disclosure. But what do our allies and our enemies know about the phenomena, and why have they not already disclosed? 
Why is this an international issue and not just an American one? And what does that tell us about the phenomena? We will discover how studies of the phenomena in other countries, as well as in the US, are plagued by events that have no rational explanation. We will see what should be a scientific... We will see how what should be scientific bleeds over into what should be religion and how the fusion of both stimulates studies in consciousness and how this aspect of a field that should be mundane has led to madness and suicide in some of our most prominent researchers and mysterious deaths in others. Will there be an alien invasion? Has it already happened? Are the governments of the world prepared for contact with the government of the sky? Are we ready for war? That was longer than I thought, but that's the blurb for the book. It sounds really interesting, just as interesting as the first two. and and. I'm excited for it. Absolutely. Nice little roundup at the end there. Thank you very much. There you go. I can um, breathe now. <laughs> yes. Um, folks, uh, Dan, thank you for your time. Uh, the interview with Danny Sheen will be out in the next couple of days. I've got another couple of guests um, confirmed dates today, so I'll put that out soon um, once I've got those. And I just want to say one thing, Dan, after we done the breakdown on the, the Nazca mummy stuff a few oh, sure. days ago, really um, emotive comments, emotive subject for lots and lots of people. I was surprised. Um, but people shouldn't feel bad about having a different opinion to, to anyone, including me, Dan, or anyone else. Don't ever apologize in the comments for disagreeing with our thoughts on something yeah. because ultimately none of us know. Um, and if you can agree and you can disagree and debate with each other, all, all good. Um, I'm still of the opinion, you know, I, I hope something comes of it. I reached out to the, the law firm who are representing the three American scientists who have got on board, still hoping to hear back the they got back to me but it's going to be hard to get interviews basically um and yeah I, I, it seems like a long game from what those scientists said so but yeah i, I loved everyone's comments I, I do read through them i just don't always get a chance to reply so yeah don't feel bad about having a different opinion because in this subject we could all be right could all be wrong we're not going to not all going to be right sorry but we very much all could be wrong so imagine yeah. if we were all right and and we could own all have our own adventure it would it would be interesting, but the the really law firm, confusing. it would be very confusing, right? <laughs> I almost think it'd be better if we were all wrong, and it was something totally different, which is likely. Is it, is it Family Guy where like Jesus comes back and he comes down and it's like, oh, who was right? Oh, it was the Buddhists, and it's like the Buddhists oh, were I correct, think, something like that. I think Family Guy in South Park in South Park it was the Mormons, wasn't it? And yeah. it's like it was the Mormons. And they're like, oh, the, no, the, there's almost like, ah, oh, that's who was correct. That's it, and that could be <laughs> it. That could be the UFO um, subject in a nutshell. That something else totally different comes out, and we were all completely wrong. So until next time, Dan, thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks everyone for listening. We can all be wrong again together next time. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a Tic Tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more ass.